Yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Vivian. It's a pleasure to be making this broadcast to you. Um, I really need to appreciate all of you for your patience for joining us this evening. And I really want to start by appreciating PMI Ghana for the invite. Interesting story, really. Um, I got the invite by mistake. I mean, I just went to, into my spam message box, um, which I don't normally do. And there it was. I'd like to thank um, Teresa and most especially Andy. You've just been so helpful. We've been having technical glitches all along, and um, he patiently stayed on to ensure that we could have this very important um, talk today. I consider really important because I think um, negotiation is a key skill, a critical key soft skill that every project manager, indeed everyone, should have. Um, once again, I thank you for joining us this evening. I thank you for the honor done me, and I hope that um, you will learn a thing or two that would help you with your practice as you go along. I think negotiation is a key skill that we need even at this time, even more so. Um, I live in Nigeria and everyone who knows what's happening now, knows about the recession, knows about what's going on. And right now is a time when we can no longer accommodate waste. So, ways, better efficient and effective ways of managing resources that have been entrusted to us as project managers. We have human, we have material resources. We need to know how to negotiate a way and find a better way of maximizing these resources that have been entrusted in our care. So straight away, um, we will go into our presentation. I do hope I don't have challenges with this one as well. Um, Andy, if we can see this, do let me know um, so that I can go ahead because I'm going to be walking through my slides rather quickly. So, this is how it works, right? Um, we're going to be looking at a bit, bit of intro. Negotiation, this particular paper that I'm presenting is actually the medium to high level class on negotiation. So what I'll be doing in the first few minutes is to go through highlights, talking through the important things that you need to know, the lingua, the vocabulary of negotiation so that you get acquainted with it for those of you who are new to the subject matter. Then we'll go and talk a bit about strategic negotiations. We'll talk about the complexity we find as project managers in negotiating. We'll also talk a bit about women in negotiation. And we'll talk about conflict, managing conflict, and come to a brief interaction. Now I'm going to be, um, I, I like to be quite interactive. Sadly, this is a one way presentation, so I feel much like I'm talking on a radio when I have listeners. So I'll try to make it as informative and as engaging as possible. I'll be asking questions along the line, and you also take notes of your questions. At the end of this talk, you would have the opportunity to connect with me through LinkedIn, where you can ask questions, clarifications, and then if you need any more, you can just get back to me and we'll see how we can help you along the line. Also, uh, PMI Ghana has graciously um, given you this so that you can in one PDU. Um, so you would also have an opportunity to claim that. So straight away, it's quite a long paper, so I will be speaking quite um, fast through it, and I just hope you pick a thing or two. So straight away, what is negotiations? Negotiation is something we do every day in life. Um, it's a fact of life. Orion Fisher, who are, uh, who are an authority on the subject, tell us that it's a back and forth communication designed to reach an agreement. The other person who has an interest in the subject get to discuss and agree on something. Um, they want something, you want something. But the key here is that your negotiation has to be strategic. 
I will be talking about negotiations, yes, as it relates to projects. But the fact is, it's a fact of life. It's something we do every day. It's something you do with your spouse. It's something you do at work. It's something you do with business partners. You do it all the time. But as respect to projects, you have multiple stakeholders. And that is what is critical to understand, that when you're negotiating, you're negotiating with people. And once you have people in the mix, there's a potential for conflict. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. Why? Because everybody wants a piece of the pie. Everybody wants something. There's something at stake. And you have to understand how to share it to get what is optimally yours. Now, because there is conflict, there are risks and there are challenges. And you need to be better equipped to be able to take on those risks and challenges. And that is why it's important to go for strategic negotiation, high-level negotiation. Negotiation where you want to protect the relationship, where you want a long-lasting re relationship. Not negotiation that is transactional, not a short-term one, not the one that you don't want to have anything to do with the person in the future, but something you want to be able to smile and laugh with the person the next day. So it's non-adversarial. It's a problem-solving. You treat your your co-negotiator as a partner. You read advocates. So, as I said, so just to get familiar with the vocabulary of negotiation, I looked at it on what does it mean to be strategic? When do you negotiate? What are the skills you need to have? And how do you negotiate? Strategic negotiation, as I said, is important that you are ethical and you're principled. You have to have principles. You just don't go into negotiation for the heck of it, you go into it because you want something. You go with it in it with a purpose and a plan. You negotiate, as I said, when you want to procure things. I've worked in the procurement industry, or rather in project management, and construction industry for upwards of 20 years, and I've seen it all. You want to make a purchase, you want to negotiate contracts, you want to negotiate all any form of purchase, you have to negotiate, and you have to be skilled at it to get what you want. How do you negotiate? Are you adversarial? Is it distributive? Is it positional? Or do you actually go for a win-win? What skills do you need to have? You need to be able to communicate properly. You need to be able to do research. You need to be able to manage your emotions. You need to empathize. Be in the other person's shoes. You need to know your project management. Must you negotiate? No, not all the time. There's something called alternative dispute resolution. You need to know when and how to negotiate. You need to know when negotiation is no longer an option, but you need to litigate. You also know when to mediate and when to deliberate. What is important, according to John Walsh, who was a, a Nobel Prize winner, in the year 1994, was that negotiations should maximize minimum gains. You should be able to have an efficient, fair, and smart way of negotiating stuff so that what comes to you is what you deserve without hurting or damaging the relationship with the next person. Ryan Fisher, in your book, a masterpiece, I must say, talked about negotiation as involves an orange, where you have two people who want one orange. Yes, you could split that orange into two, and everybody goes away 50-50. But ultimately, that might not be an efficient way of negotiating. That might not be an efficient way of dividing the resource. Because you could find that party A actually just wants the liquid. And party B just wants the rind. So you need to know what each party wants. And you can only find that out when you communicate and communicate effectively. Benefits of negotiation. Now, this is a research done by Linda Babcock. And she talks about students who negotiated when they wanted to get a job. At the age of 22, one person negotiated at 40,000 per annum, and the other person 
or the first person failed to negotiate, the second person actually negotiated $4,000, much more than the first person. And her research, she found out that the gap at the time they were both 65 was $14,000 between the person who negotiated and the person didn't. And what that came to was that the person who negotiated earned $627,355 at the end of the day. She also did that for people who were at the age of 27 and 65, and the difference came up to $839,412,000. Now you can see that is a great disparity between those who have the courage, the confidence to negotiate and those who don't. When you want to negotiate, you need to be aware of certain things. Besides preparing, building a rapport, setting clear goals, being persuasive, and coming to an agreement and then taking action steps, you need to be aware of certain things that are at play when you negotiate. First of all, you need to know that power is a play. You need to know that you ought to be principled. You need to know that you are going for a win-win. You are going to collaborate. You need to be sure of your timing. And you need to be able to anchor your price. And most importantly, you need information. Information is power, information is key. If you have information about your opponent, you have the confidence to make bids and see them come to pass. Now, all this I have said is on a high level. We are about to go, after talking about the negotiation process, we'll go into detail and talk a bit more about how we can effectively use the skills to be able to ensure a win-win when we negotiate. The negotiation process is all there. There's a pre-negotiation preparation. There's an adage that says, those that fail to plan, plan to fail. Do you plan to fail? No, then you have to prepare. You need to gather data. You need to have some form of beginning power analysis. You need to prepare for your meeting. You need to gather your team. You need to plan your strategy. Are you gonna play good cop, bad cop? Are you gonna be aggressive at the beginning? Are you going to recline at some point? Then in the negotiation interaction, you need to have an opening. Most of all, you need to build rapport. You need to connect with the person you're negotiating with. Sometimes the negotiation is won or lost at the very beginning. Interestingly, just from building rapport, just from showing empathy, and the person suddenly softens towards you. Oh, really? I can see that plaque behind you. Did you go to an Ivy League school like I did? Did you go to Harvard? And the person just softens and says, really, you know, you've been to Paris? And just that, you endure yourself. And before you know, the negotiation is done and you've won. Post-negotiation follow-up. After all this, forget the contract bit. Don't forget to tidy up the loose ends. Ensure you monitor and evaluate. But all these are on the slides, which you would have. PMI will make available to you and you can get on my LinkedIn page. You can look at them and you can understand. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get back to me. The keys to negotiation. It can't be overflowed. Enter for a win-win. That is key. If the other person sees you're interested in him winning as you are, you gain your trust. You have to research your opponent. What do they really want? I told you the story about the orange, right? And that's it. You could split the orange and the person who wants the peel just takes out the peel and tosses the rest away. That's a loss. But you have found that what she really wanted was just a rind. You would have given her that and had the whole juice for yourself. Dress the part. Now I really like that part. So people going to negotiate, hoping to get, get a bargain, hoping that the other party will be sympathetic and a cause. But they don't look as like, if they need that cause. They actually want a million bucks. And when they start to negotiate a cost, a cost in price, the other party is, are you putting, having me on? You must be kidding. So of course, dress the part. 
speak their language, mirror them, build rapport, as I said before. Never forget, prepare, prepare, and prepare. So now quickly, we have gone through the basics, as I said, real high level, just to get you um, acquainted with the language, the lingua of negotiation, ZOPA, Batner, reservation value, anchoring, framing, and now let's go into detail. When you go into negotiations, you don't go blind. You have to go equipped with certain skills. You need to know how to listen actively. Some people talk and talk and talk, and they don't listen. The truth is, when you listen, you're bound to hear things that would help you build your case. You need to be open and aware of verbal cues. Um, there is a saying, research showed, that yes, 10% of communication is done by speech, but actually 60% is done by verbal, non-verbal cues. Non-verbal cues, the way you sit, the way you talk. The way you talk really doesn't matter as much as the way you look. What signs do you give up? When you're talking to your opponent, do you look straight in their eyes? Or do you flinch? Or do you have certain gestures to give you away? Now, even with that, I just talked about looking in the eyes. In some cultures, that is considered rude. So we'll talk a bit about culture and non-verbal cues in a bit. Ethical practice. Some people lie, which is very, very wrong. Because if you're caught in a lie, you lose trust. You lose the trust and the confidence of the person you're negotiating with. And they're bound to leave that table without the deal getting done. You need to be analytical. You need to have give principled arguments. You should exhibit emotional control and display empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in the shoes of the other person. Emotional control, display emotional intelligence. That is by Daniel Coleman, who says that you should be able to recognize your own emotions and manage them as well as manage those of others. Then you should have decision-making skills. Don't be the one who keeps changing and shifting and wavering at every point. You need to be firm. And for you to be firm, you actually need to know what you want and going with that knowledge. So, I spoke a bit, a little bit of exercise. What's at stake? Let's try this. Um, it's still one way, but I would put certain questions to you and you could test yourself and say, am I right or wrong? Now, I do sometimes go around to give talks, lectures, not really used to this um, webinar stuff. And um, at some point I was invited from Abuja where I reside to come and give a lecture in Ghana. And from Ghana, um, I was supposed to visit Mali. Now the people in Ghana decided, why don't you come and um, we will pay your, 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 your fare and the people in Mali said, come along as well, and we'll also pay your fare. And I was like, fine, why don't we do this at the same time so I can just commute a round trip and come back? And why don't you collaborate and get back to me and let me know how it goes? So Ghana and Mali have a web conference, and they say, fine, um, why don't we do this? Let's split the fare 50-50. And Ghana goes 50-50, no, that, that, that won't work for us. Why? Because if we had to pay for a round trip from Nigeria to Ghana, we'll pay about 1,200. And um, if we split the total fare of 3,600, it will come to $1,350. That won't work for us. That's a bit much more than what we would have paid if we had to just do a round trip. So Mali says, OK, I understand. Why don't we do it this way? You pay one way 600, we pay in one way 900, and the balance of one, um, 1,200, we split it both ways. What would you do if Mali, what would you say if you were Mali? Mali says, no, that's um, 
or rather Ghana says no, that doesn't work for us as well because um, we'll be paying exactly 1,200, which is a round trip. And then you get to pay much less than your 2,400 round trip. Oh, where is this going at? So Mali says, okay, why don't we just do it ratio wise? You know, and uh, Ghana still says not, 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 not happening, not happening because um, you are still paying far less than what you would have paid if it was a round trip. And we are still inching closer to our round trip, so that's not fair. So what would you do? That's the question I would ask. What, what, what logical, efficient, fair solution would you give to this? And um, I would suggest, which I think it's an ethical, a smart, a right, efficient way, and a fair way, most importantly, of doing this, is to split the game. What is the total fare that Ghana will pay? A thousand two. What is the total fare if um, Mali would pay? Two thousand four. The total is three sixty. Now, if they go one way, they actually save nine hundred, because if they go one way around, it's two thousand seven. If you add nine hundred, it's three sixty. So that savings is what is accrued to both of them if they work together. So they work together and they save 900. If you split that 900 two ways, it's 450 each. And they deduct that from your round trip, both ways. And you see what it comes to. Ghana gets to pay $750 instead of 1,002, and Mali gets to pay 1950 $19, instead of 2004. That is fairness and that is efficiency. If you got that right, you are a negotiator halfway. So what is important is that you list your alternatives. You evaluate those alternatives. You establish your partner. We'll talk about partner in a bit. That's the best alternative to a negotiated settlement or a negotiated alternative. Then you also call calculate your reservation value based on your partner. So, as I said, summarized, the partner is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. You have agreed on something. You know this is what you want. You're going into the ex negotiation with this value in your head, that this is what you want. However, because people are coming into this with their own wife firms, known as what is it? What is your interest? We, we, we all come in with different interests. We all come in, we all come in with what's in it for me. So you come in with your wife firm and you say, I want this instead. Now what the partner is your walkaway point. Is that value you give to that which you're negotiating, which you say, look, if I can't get this for this value, I'm walking away. This is the lowest price or the best price, the least price I can take for this item. If I can get it at this price, this is my alternative. And you're ready to walk away if you don't get it at that reservation value based on your partner. Now, the truth about a partner is it's an alternative to what you really want. So if you cannot get what you really want, you go to the partner, but your partner must be good enough. Or you must have a partner. If not, you would lose what you want. And I'll give you a good illustration of that. Here I'm talking about negotiation range, but I'm going to tell you another story and I would ask you a question. Now, the a prime land came up at the coast of a bitch for gaming purposes, real estate land. And this farmer who owned part of this land needed to sell it. He needed some money. So he called a, an agri professor and said, sir, please could you come and value my land for me? And the professor came, looked at the land, did some soil tests and said, hmm, this land is what? Three million dollars. And the farmer said, fine. Now, when he went into negotiation with the real estate people, he allowed them to frame. 
Now, what is important about framing the negotiation is that you anchor it. When you make a proposal that is framing, you give the first bid and the others fall in line. So he said it's three million. And he didn't tell them, he was quiet and they framed. They said, yes, we will offer you seven million for this land. The farmer was excited. That was much more than what he wanted. But he said, no, um, I'll go for nine million. And they looked at each other and said, mm, okay, why don't we give you this for 8.5 million? Of course, that was much more than what he expected. And the deal was sealed. Good? It would be interesting to know how many of you say that was good. Truth is, that was very bad. If Farmer had gotten himself an expert in the gaming industry, he, who, he would have checked and seen what the real value of having a gaming industry on that land was, and he would have advised him appropriately. That land was what? Upwards of $20 million. But you could say Farmer was happy. He went home happy because he had just gotten 5.5 more than what was his reservation value. Now, if he had a partner, he had a best alternative to whatever they offered him, he would have walked off with much more than he did. But as I said, your partner must always be realistic, practical, and achievable. Negotiating complexities. So far from my, from my talk, you would have, and we said there's a lot more to negotiating than just sitting down and saying, um, I'll pay you a price. Take, for instance, the story I just told you. It's much more than price. Farmer should have had also considered how much he would pay the person who came to value the land. He would also have to consider how much tax he would have to part with. There are a lot of things that go into selling a land that possibly he didn't factor in. And that is a mistake all of us, some of us make when we're negotiating. We forget that there are other additional costs. So we negotiate just costs. We forget to negotiate packages. The idea is to negotiate packages. The totality, you have to look at the, the total perspective of whatever you're negotiating for and then deal with it point by point for you not to should change yourself. A young man sold a vehicle to someone else and after they had sealed on the deal, I'll buy this car from you, 5001, and they had sealed and they shook hands. And just as the young man was about to leave, the buyer tells him, I will pick up the car as soon as you fill it up. Now, fuel was going to cost him $500 that was not factored into the cost of the of the vehicle so you could see that he was about to lose five hundred dollars and just make four thousand six hundred on that car that is what happens when you don't have a total picture of what you're negotiating stakeholders the primary people we negotiate with are stakeholders you should be able to identify them know that you're just not negotiating with team a and team b as you can see here you're also talking with indirect actors. You're talking about interested observers. You're talking with a negotiator, but he has an observer, and he also has a boss who's calling the shots. In, in construction industry, you're negotiating with a contractor. The consultant works for a client. And as well, you have other external stakeholders in industry who are also interested in the negotiations. So you have to identify all of them. You have to research their why firms, what's in it for me. You have to research their culture. You have to also research their partner. And ironically, you find out that everybody has a partner, even on your team. You also ensure you have to go for a win-win. Be ready to adapt and also be ready to collaborate. In contracts, the mirror image rule. You have to do unto others what you expect to do them to do to you. You have to recognize offer revocation. I often tell the story of two young men who sat at a bar 
And after getting very, very drunk, they were watching an Arsenal match, interestingly, an Arsenal and Chelsea. Yeah, Chelsea, I'm a Chelsea fan. Yeah, and they were watching this match and they made a bet in their drunk state. And one offered to give his car to the other guy if, yeah, let's go with Chelsea, if Chelsea won the match. And sure enough, Chelsea, we blues, we won the match. And the next day, when the drunken stupor had cleared off, the Chelsea fan walks to the Arsenal's fan's house and says, I need my car. And the guy was like, no, that didn't happen. And he said, yes, that did happen. I want my car. And he says, no, guess what? They ended up in court. Now, one part of the one party was revoking the contract. Oh, I forgot to add. They actually signed off on this on a napkin in their drunken stupor. So there was actually evidence. They signed off. So guess who, guess who went home with the car? Recognize negotiator authority. Sometimes the person you are negotiating with does not have the authority. Does that make whatever he negotiates legally binding? Negotiator intention. What was the intent? You need to be clear about the law for you not to shoot yourself in the feet. What does the law say? There must be offer. There must be agreement. There must be intent. Yeah. And the people who are negotiating must be of consent in age. So you need to be aware of this before you go into negotiations. International negotiations is also key. That is all the talk about culture. The world is a global village now. From time to time, we negotiate with people that are not from where we come from. They're you not know, from a race, they're you not know, from a culture. You need to be aware. Um, even in your own country, you're from different backgrounds. You need to understand that yes, while culture is important, you mustn't stereotype. Um, I discussed four types of culture here, the dignity culture, the honor culture, um, face culture, and the, yeah, and face culture. Um, in psychology, we recognize two main kinds of culture, the individualistic culture and the collectivist. The individuals are like the Americans, the Canadians, the Britons, they have a lot of autonomy, they are, they, they're self-regulated, they're individualistic, so to speak. They are prone to go into negotiations man-to-man, -man, as in one-on-one, -on -one, as compared to those from the face culture or the collectivist culture, so to speak, those from China and Japan. Now, um, what I've done here would help if you ever find yourself in such a situation. It tells you your traits. Um, it also tells you your strategy. Um, and to be able to recognize, so to speak, what you're dealing with if you have to ever negotiate with people from these cultures. However, I said here, do not stereotype. Recognize the possibility of cultural impact, but avoid stereotyping. Establish rapport. Investigate and understand your culture. Get an interpreter if need be. Understand ethical issues. In our part of the world and in parts of China, giving of gifts is accepted. Um, it's even encouraged. Um, in Japan, if you reject a, key, a gift, it's an insult. But in the individualistic culture, it's recognized as a bribe that you need to be conscious of. So when you're going into these cultures, um, I was reading it, um, recently that, um, that some of the laws in the United States have to be, well, changed a bit because of when they have to um, practice in international terrains, they sometimes have to contend with such issues when they have to get jobs. So you have to recognize it and you have to know how to deal with it while staying within your, the ethical confines of your organization and of your society. Enlist advisors, preferably in the home country. Also get interpreters that are sound, that are ethical, that will tell you what is actually being said. Then most of all, people ignore this and they run into a lot of trouble. Consider the political, the economical, the social, technological, legal aspects of that society. Some people go into negotiations without considering forex fluctuation. I see that a lot in construction. And right now we are battling with several projects because the forex um, fluctuation, the disparity between 
uh, local currency and the dollar is so high that it has pushed uh, contracts sometimes over a hundred percent increase. And um, you, you have to contend with that. So you need to recognize that and you need to know how to deal with that within the contractual provisions. Now, I would not um, leave without saying a word or two to, I want to believe that I have a few women in the house. And then I would like to talk about this because it's dear to me and I believe women um, need to know a bit about negotiation so that it can give you a little bit of edge. Now, I was reading recently again that we're about 7.8 billion in the earth and only about 2.2% are men. The rest are women. And out of that, approximately 4 billion women, only 78% who work earn as much as men do. Now that is really sad and that is really so unfair. So you wonder what, what's going on? Why are women not earning as much as their male contemporaries? Is it that they can't or they won't? Yeah. Um, this research, again, done by Linda Bangkok, shows that among students, only 12.5% women were able to negotiate the sal salaries as compared to 51.5% men. Now, I know you would find that a bit odd because in, in my part of the world, women are quite aggressive marketers when they go shopping. But yeah, she did that research too. And if you see this last quadrant here, you'll find out when it comes to payment, which is the same thing here, more men are willing to negotiate as compared to women, 59, and women, 38. But when it comes to things like decorations, food stuff, you know, nice, pretty things, women are quite aggressive. You can see the margin, you can see the gap there. 48.6 as compared to 24.1. So yeah, apparently the things that are nice and beautiful, the appeals to women, we are quite aggressive. But when it comes to remuneration, when it comes to getting a raise in the office, we seem to be advanced to negotiating. More men are also um, the red negotiate frequently, more frequently than women. So why? Why? And um, from research, to been shown that one, there's a subtle gender bias that exists. Priming from birth. I mean, look at the way you treat your kids. Men are taught to be tough, aggressive. And women are, men are brought up to be gentle, respectful. You want to negotiate with your son to, 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 to clean the lawn, to mow the lawn or something, and you tell him, I'll give you this. And the woman, don't you know your place is in the kitchen? So you groom her from birth. She's primed from birth to be subservient, to be gentle, to keep a low tone. And men are out there getting aggressive because that is the way. The fear of backlash, because of that priming, because of that grooming, Women are afraid of backlash. If I'm seen as aggressive, if I, if I negotiate, I'm seen as aggressive. And then people don't like me. So that fear is there. Then people dislike them. Oh, she's too aggressive. She's too harsh. So what can women do to circumvent these issues? You have to present the value of self. What do you bring to the table? What can you offer in your organization? When you go to negotiate, go with a problem-solving face and not as, uh, as war, as yes, if you're going through a battle. They say women are quite emotional. You should be able to put that on the check. Exhibit some form of emotional control, emotional intelligence. Be persuasive. Don't be manipulative. Persuade, this is what I bring to the table. I think this is what I want. Give options, not ultimatums. If you don't do this, uh, that's a problem with ultimatums. If you don't have a partner, if you don't have a job to walk off to, if you don't have that em employment letter in your pocket, don't give an ultimatum. In my part of the world, there are like 10 people lined up waiting to take your job. If you give an ultimatum and say, I'm leaving, they'll say, oh, when, when do you leave? Remain assertive, not aggressive. Cooperate, don't compete. Focus on the purpose. Why are you now, why are you, why do you want what you want? Why do you make this demand? Network, build authenticity, play the we, not the I card. I like that one. When a man goes and says, I demand this, 
they say, yes, yes, he's assertive. And when a woman goes, I demand this and uh, why? So you go and say, we, the women, want this. Now you're playing that even the women will empathize with you. They would say, yes, she wants this for us. Just a few tips for the ladies out there. Now, as I said, because women are, people are involved in negotiations, there's bound to be conflict. How do you manage conflict? There are different ways you can avoid, you can force, you can compete, you can accommodate, you can compromise, or you can collaborate. But you need to know when to do what. When do you compete? Now, I got this um, from Avzalu Rahim, um, and he puts this on a quadrant of concern for self and importance of the relationship. You compete when your concern for yourself is high. And when the, when the relationship is low, you don't really care about the relationship. It's not a long-term relationship. And that is what we see um, when we go to tender. Tender processes are purely transactional in contracts. You want to get the best price. So, but you only do that for items that are a lot in the market. You don't do that for items that are scarce, right? So if you have a lot of variety in the market, you can afford to compete. And the relationship that doesn't matter to you, you procure what you want is shop 10, transactional, and the person goes. But if it's a long-term relationship, you want to collaborate because possibly that item that you want to procure is scarce. So because it's scarce in the market, you want to build a long-term relationship. You want to go into future buying, forward buying, where you peg the price and say, yes, I will give you this volume if you peg it at this price so that there's fluctuations or otherwise, I will pay you a percentage in view of this and in time you will give it to me. So there, the concern for yourself is, yes, high, but, as, but the relationship also important to you. There's also avoiding when the concern for yourself really is not important and also the relationship is not important. And you also have accommodating. The middle of all this is a compromise. That is another option of negotiating conflict. ADR, we mentioned, is also another way of negotiating, of, of dealing with negotiation disputes. And um, what are the ways? What are dispute resolution methods? Now, this quadrant, again, by Sonia Siegel, Siegler, tells us what you should do when and why. What are the deciding factors? If cost makes sense, if cost is of essence, you don't want to litigate. And I'll show you why in a bit. You also don't want to admit arbitrate. Mediate is well an option. DRB stands for Dispute Resolution Board or Neutral Driven. Now, if you look at nine there, it says stays private. If you have thrown caution to the wind, you really don't care about your privacy, by all means, litigate. Arbitration is a bit safer, mediation as well, and the other options. So this quadrant gives you a fair idea of when you should choose what kind of dispute resolution. If you get into an impasse with your partner, what do you do? And that's my next story. Is litigation really what it? You could say, yes, I've come to the end of my wits. I've come to my wits end. Um, um, this is going nowhere. I want to go to court. And this is a story between Kofi and his partner, Mensa. I understand I didn't spell that all too well. Now, Kofi Men Consult has a net worth of $20 million. Kofi has... 51% shares, and Mensa has 49% shares. And um, there's a conflict. And Mensa says, I want out. I want my share, and I want half. The 20 million, I want 10 million. Kofi says, that's not going to work. And Kofi says, I will pay you 8.5 million. And Mensa says, that won't work. Well, let's go to court. Now, what Mensa failed to calculate, number one, is his partner. 
he had a 70% probability of winning, winning, and he would get 10 million. A 30% possibility of losing, and he would make only 3 million. He also had to pay a $500 legal fees. If he had calculated it back now, he would have earned just 7.4 million. By the time he realized this, he was like, why didn't I stay with that 8.5 million? Because if I really lose at this point, all I would make is 3 million. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a dicey situation. It's a risk you have to take, but you should take a calculated risk before you do that. When to lit lit um, litigate? If you want, insist on having a power, then stay with negotiation and go all the way to litigation where you lose the power and you leave the power in the hands of the jury and your lawyers. And guess what? You have a heavy, heavy fee to pay. Because as you can see with litigation, you have tons of people involved as, concert, con as compared to direct negotiation, arbitration, or mediation. So it's also nice to consider this table a nice one even if I would have changed the level of question, the level of question in this aspect, when it comes to direct negotiation, is not as high as it shows here. It should actually have stopped at conciliation. Because with direct negotiation, there is no question by an external party. This is just talking about the strategies to resolve conflicts. Don't take it personal. It's not about you. Agree on a common framework. Never give up. And understand the perspective of your lawyer. Your lawyer in, is in this to make a living. So he would advise you to go to court. But do you really need to go to court? Explore all other options before you go to court. Learn to listen. Learn to understand exactly what is at stake before you go to court. Now, this table, um, this slide just tries to tie it on in. It's an, it's an interesting scenario that happened in Nigeria um, a few years back between the federal government and um, the MTN. MTN, they provide uh, mobile services and um, the government had directed at some point that they, they, they register all their users. MTN had failed to register about 5.2 billion and of the of the subscribers, and the the federal government had fined them a thousand dollars per person, and asked them to pay about 5.2 billion dollars in fine. But they did certain things. Why? Because they know their negotiations. They first of all apologized. Then they got in their president to come and visit the president of the country. And by the time the president gone, left back to his country, um, the fine had reduced 3.9 billion. Interesting, right? But that they didn't stop there. They also got um, a US Attorney General, a former US Attorney General, Eric Holder, to um, litigate for them. He took the federal government to court. And effectively, Another brilliant strategy, the, court, the case was put on hold, so they didn't have to pay the fine. And the federal government um, wasn't uh, inclined to take legal actions, so there was an out-of-court settlement. And at the end of the day, 5.2 billion reduced to 1.7 billion. Initially, they had offered the federal government 1.5 billion. The settlement was 1.7 billion, remarkable. A lot of citizens still think it's a, it's, it was a rape on the country, but the guys got what they wanted. They used the negotiation skills, they used power, expert power, they used politics, they used, they brought out everything from the arsenal and made major savings from what they were initially fined. However, the country also got something out of it. It was a win-win, really, because the federal government had been trying to get MTN to register, to list their shares in the stock exchange. So that was one of the options they gave them when they went to settlement and said, if you do this, 
we will do this. And ultimately, everybody went smiling home. I think MTN still went smiling home much more because from then, they made the highest record in shares rise to 13%. So by 13 percent to 140 rand. I think that was a good one. Finally, I'm drawing to a close now. You need to know no end to negotiate. You need to have the skills to negotiate. You need to be able to discuss. You need to know when to come compromise so that you can have a deal. And when you're able to have a good deal, you can see your business rising. In psychology, we talk about the Pygmalion effect. And I think I'll leave you with this. The Pygmalion effect is also known as a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's known as knowing what you want. It builds confidence in you. What all the self-fulfilling prophecy is saying is our actions towards others in negotiating impacts others' belief in us. And it causes others' actions towards us. It reinforces our beliefs about ourselves. And again, it starts to influence our actions towards others. So when you're going into negotiations, know, first of all, when to negotiate. Be able to identify the stakes. You need to prepare, you need to plan and prepare. It's never enough, it's never too much. Get information. It's it's key. It builds your power, it builds your confidence. Never ignore culture, but do not stereotype. Collaborate, ensure a win-win. Get the law, know your contract. Proactively manage conflict. And ultimately, for the my ladies, manage gender bias. On a final note, let us never negotiate out of fear but let us never fear to negotiate. The words of a great man, John F. Kennedy. Thank you. Viviana Bona, and that is my link on LinkedIn. The slides are available there. I believe they contain a wealth of knowledge. You can see them there or PMI will make them available to you. This is my credits for your PDUs. Um, send your name and your PMI number. To that link below and you will get your one pdu for this presentation once again i want to say thank you i'm really honored to have been have the opportunity to give this webinar to you pmi ghana and thank you for listening and i do hope you've learned a thing or two thank you and have a good evening <laughs>